Thank you, sir. So first, uh, hello, everyone. A very warm evening to all. Uh, greetings to the opening session of 2024 hosted by Cultural Studies Research Forum. Uh, it is an integral part of our Valad, Valad education. We extend our gratitude for your presence and for paying homage to our esteemed resource person, Dr. Manshi Grover. Your company is uh, our delight and we look forward to your continued presence until the conclusion of this session. Following Dr. Manshi Grover's discourse, we invite your questions through the chat box or you may engage in any direct conversation as well with regard CSRF team. Now, uh, I would like to invite Dintika Mahinder. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, just a formal uh, introduction of yours. So please allow us to do that. So Dintika, are you ready? Will you please you. Uh, turn on your camera? Yeah, ma'am. Over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to a new episode hosted by the Cultural Studies Research Forum. This evening is going to be magical as we have a special guest, Dr. Mansi Grover with us. We all are very excited about today's discussion. I, Dintika, on behalf of Team CSRF, I'm truly honored to speak before you all and address this esteemed gathering. Cultural Studies Research Forum, inaugurated on 13th April 2021, is a non-profit enterprise started by Vallat, largely operated with student initiatives. CSRF aims to promote free public lectures and discussions in various aspects of research and to increase the awareness of students in cultural studies. From new research areas to new literatures, from current advances in multidisciplinary studies to the latest theoretical terminology, from poetry to dance, music, and food, CSRI is the happening place to gather and experience this rich diversity. CSRF also serves as an active assembly to enhance one's communication skill, expressivity, critical thinking, and even suggest future avenues for creative research. Several engaging talks are conducted under CSRF, which entertains as well as enriches our view on different cultures and practices. Now, today at CSRF, we heartily welcome our respected resource person and independent researcher and theater practitioner, Dr. Mansi Grover Mann. Dr. Grover has a doctorate degree in English from Jamia Milia Islamia, New Delhi. For her PhD, she has examined the representation of women with disabilities in Hindi cinema since 1970. As you already know, she is a theater practitioner and works with a Delhi-based theater group. Her areas of interest include cultural studies, disability studies, feminist studies, age studies, film studies, and performance studies. After becoming familiar with Ma'am's endeavors, I witnessed Swami Vivekanand's famous quote, when you come into the world, leave a mark. With that said, let us invite Dr. Mansi Grover to enlighten us with her profound knowledge on disability studies. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dintika and Koel. Uh, I don't know how profound I would be, but I would... Uh, my aim of this lecture would be to make it more simpler for you. Uh, I try to keep it very simple to because I feel it's a very newer area and I don't wish to bombard you with too many theories. So I'll try to make it simpler for all of you since it's an introductory lecture. 
even I was confused how to go about it since uh, I have, I think, one hour time. Coil, am I right? Yes, ma'am. The lecture is, uh, du like, the duration of the lecture is one hour, right? Uh, yes, one hour. Right. You can also continue after right. that. No problem. Okay, okay. So, even I was confused what all to include, what all to exclude. Uh, my PhD was uh, mainly on women with disabilities. But for this lecture, I would keep it more general, not make it a very gendered kind of study. We will come to that when we talk about intersectionalities. But let us first, and I would like to keep it more like uh, an interactive session. So in between, I would also ask a few questions to the people who are participating. Uh, I would not call myself an expert in the area, but I have done my PhD. So I feel that, you know, I, as a scholar, as a researcher, it's my duty to pass it on to others. So just because of that kind of responsibility, I'm taking this, uh, you know, uh, I thought of, you know, uh, being a part of this lecture series. Okay, so I do have uh, some slides for you all. So I am going to share my screen here. Uh, Koel, just let me know if it is visible or not. I'm just, give me a minute, okay? Um, yeah. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. So what I'll do is I'll put the slideshow on. Right. So uh, the topic of my lecture today is it's better to die than be disabled. An introduction to disability studies. Now, first of all, I just thought, let me clarify the topic here. Uh, this is taken from a film uh, and I will use references from films in my lecture here. I, I feel films are a great way to understand this discipline. And uh, for my own study, I I must have studied some 70 films. Uh, as I can remember for each chapter, there were some seven films that are referred to. So seven to eight films and not just that, but as secondary texts, as the other texts. So there were some 70 films that I watched uh, during the time of my PhD. So I will be using references from the film. I will not keep it. Uh, um, I do have references from Hindi films, but I'll keep it more general to make you understand what I'm trying to say. So the theories that I'm bringing in here would be explained through examples from the films to make it more accessible, to make it more simpler for you. Okay, now the topic here, it's better to die than be disabled. Now, this is taken from a film called Arzu. This was a 1965 Hindi film where the female protagonist, out of the fear of being disabled, out of the fear of losing a limb, she says a line like this. And that line hovers throughout the film. Do you all, uh, do you understand Hindi? I am just uh, checking. Do you all understand Hindi or? Uh, Ma'am, not uh, all, but many of them. Okay. Are there. So, yes, uh, the Hindi translation yes, of this line was, Apahej hone se to mar jana behetar hai. This was also uh, my introductory chapter of my thesis, where I problematized this whole idea of this fear that she had to become a disabled person. So we will talk more about this fear. So this whole idea that goes into a non-disabled imaginary when one thinks about being a disabled person. And you would listen, you would hear this line many times in your life where people would say that, you know, it's better that the person passed away because that life was of no use. 
if that person became a disabled person. So this whole idea of utility, utility of a body, we are going to problematize problematize it here through this lecture. I just have one hour to do that. What I'll try to do here is to talk about very basic idea of how do you look at a disabled person. First of all, Shakespeare said that, you know, what's in the name? Now, when we talk about a disabled person, there's a lot to do with that. What are the various names that you can talk about? What is the various kind of nomenclature that we have around us for a disabled person? Anyone? What are the various kinds of nomenclature? Yes. Divyangjan. Divyangjan. Okay. What else? Divyangjan is a very latest, uh, uh, you know, uh, nomenclature that has been given uh, by the current PM. What else? Specially abled. Specially abled. What else? Differently abled. Differently abled. Ma'am, please check chat box as well. They okay. are uh, giving the answer there. Handicapped. Okay. Yes, handicapped, apahage, person with disability, uh, mentally challenged, differently able. Yes, you are, you are all right. These are the different kind of nomenclators that are given to a person with disability. Now, one might think that, you know, it's okay if we are saying, you know, physically challenged, if we are saying handicapped, if we are saying differently abled, if we are saying specially abled. But there's, a, but there's a lot to do with the nomenclatures. And not just as a to, at a tokenistic level, but how you look at a person. So through this one lecture that I have, I will try if we can humanize the whole idea of naming a person with disability. Now, there's a difference in how we use the language. There is a person-first language that we use these days. It's where we use the word person with disability. Instead of saying differently abled or physically challenged or handicapped. So, we use the person-first language now. Where we address the person as person-first. And then we say that the person has a, some kind of disability. Some people would also use the word dis uh, as disabled people. There, a lot of people assert their disability. So it's up to that disabled person. It's up to that person with disability, how that person wants to get addressed. So this whole idea of assigning different kind of abilities to a person with disability one needs to think about that. One needs to problematize that. Now, when we also talk about nomenclatures, we need to also understand that there's a difference in uh, somebody being impaired and somebody being visible. So these are interchangeably used a lot of times, but there's a difference in that. When we talk about impairment, we talk about some sort of... Uh, it's, it's, it's more biological when we talk about impairment. It's some sort of, uh, if, if a body part is not functioning, then we call it as an impairment. But if there is some sort of barrier that gets constructed around that, we use the term disability for that. It could be due to various factors, not just one, it could be due to various factors. So there is a difference between how we use these kind of words. Now, this was just to give you a very basic idea of how do you address a person with disability. If you are talking about a biological uh, deficit, you would use the word impairment. If you are talking about uh, if a person is out in public facing some sort of accessibility issue, if a person out in public faces some, some sort of attitudinal barriers. 
then that person would be called as a disabled person. So this is a more of a nomenclature that how we use different kind of nomenclature these days. One needs to be very careful of how we use these kinds of, uh, how we address a person with disability. Right. Now, this is a very, uh, I just thought I'll give you all an exercise while we are going through the lecture. Can you all think of any one disabled character from any of the literary or cinematic texts? I don't need to know that. You can just keep it in your head. And while we are analyzing, while we are theorizing disability, you can all critically analyze that character in your head. Okay. Now, this one picture that I have used here, uh, I'll also try to give a description of the picture. Uh, you see the female protagonist sitting on a wooden log where the and uh, the male protagonist is helping out the female protagonist there. And she has hurt her foot. And this was one scene from where I took the title of the lecture. The female protagonist Usha, out of the fear of being disabled, says the line that it's better to die than be disabled. Now, the turn of events of the films are such that the male protagonist later in the film loses one of his limbs. And he's constantly reminded of what Usha said. And they are never able to meet later on in the film, they both like each other, but their relationship doesn't come to any fruition because he is constantly under the impression that Usha might just leave him for being disabled. And he doesn't want to be a burden on Usha, so he never confronts her. So this is the basic story of the film Arzu and that was one of the key areas which I thought that it could be one of the initiators to understand what happens in a non-disabled imaginary, in a non-disabled, in a non-disabled body, when that body interacts with a disabled body. What affect does a disabled body generate? in a non-disabled imaginary. So here are a few concepts which I thought I'll introduce you to. There's a very uh, in-depth work done by Rosemary Garland Thompson on staring. So she says that staring is the first visual encounter between a disabled and a non-disabled person. And what happens in that first stare? And she doesn't take it in a very, she doesn't take it in a negative sense. She says staring is one of the most important visual encounters. It's one of the most important points to look at disability, to understand disability. More than disability, to understand ability. Through this lecture, we are also trying to understand how we construct ability. And with that, how we construct disability, how we look at disability. Now, staring generates a gamut of emotions. Bill Hughes, in one of his essays, points out three emotions, pity, fear, and disgust. Now, he says that in a, in a non-disabled imaginary, these are the three emotions that get produced when a non-disabled person looks at a disabled person. Sara Ahmed, uh, she is one of the key theorists of affective theories. She calls it the sociality of emotions. And she says it is in this one stare that we are able to create I and the other. In this mere stare. So this whole idea of staring becomes so important. And how does a body react 
with the thought of disability. And with that, what are the various things that would go in a non-disabled imaginary? What are the stereotypes that we build around disability in that moment of stare? There's another theorist who calls it the primal scene of anxiety. I missed that theorist here, but I'll just mention it here. The name of the theorist is Arthur Koesen. I'll mention it in the chat box uh, maybe later on. Koesen calls it the primal scene of anxiety, that moment of first encounter between a disabled and a non-disabled. There is this whole idea of anxiety there. And I think when I posted that photo of Usha there, where, you know, she's so fearful about it, I think that is the kind of emotion that is going in Usha's mind also. That whole anxiety of, and much more. I'm not just saying that it's that there's just one emotion there. It's gamut of emotions there. And with those emotions, you also try to build a cloud of stories around disability, which I'll come to uh, in the in a few minutes, it's called the meta-narrative of disability. So there's a micro-narrative of disability. There is a meta-narrative of disability. Before that, let us look at the various kind of stereotypes associated with disability. The moment we look at a disabled person, and I feel that, you know, when we are talking about disability, we need to be very candid. Because... Disability studies is not about learning something new. First of all, it is about unlearning what we have already learned. We have learned a lot throughout our lives. What is fit? What is unfit? What is acceptable? What is unacceptable? Who is disabled? Who is non-disabled? Who is desirable? Who is non-desirable? All this we have learned throughout our lives, through various institutions around us. It could be our schools, it could be the family, it could be media, it could be religion, and many more systems which are around us. So the first step towards disability studies is to understand that we need to unlearn a lot. Unlearn a lot of ideas that we have already built, that we have internalized all our lives. So one has to be very candid about these things. And th therefore, this was the first idea that I thought I'll bring here of the stare. What do we do when we look at a disabled person? We look at that person and we build something in our head of the causation of disability, why that person became disabled. You know, there's a lot of curiosity in a non-disabled imaginary when it comes to disability. Why is there that curiosity? What do we do about that curiosity? Why do we build so many stereotypes around disability? So we are also trying to understand how we have built norms how have we built a normal and how have we built an abnormal? How something became abnormal and something became normal. So let us look at the various kind of stereotypes around disability. Disability is seen as a burden. It is seen as punishment or retribution of the sins. It is seen as something evil. Disability as sins of the past, disability because of the sins done by parents. You will see this as, you know, this kind of narrative would come in a lot of literary texts. It would come in a lot, in a lot of cinematic texts. Now, this one character that you are imagining in your head, think about that character and maybe try to 
locate that character's disability around these stereotypes. Disability as dependency, passivity. Disabled person always in need of help. Disabled as undesirable, unfit, asexual, sometimes hypersexual also. These are, uh, I'm not saying these are the only stereotypes, but this is a sort of a not exhaustive list of stereotypes. Okay, you can add more to it. And once we start analyzing our emotions, trying to understand why we feel th this kind of emotion around disability, maybe we'll add to the list. More and more stereotypes would be added to the list. Now, this is one scene that I picked from a film that was made in 1938. One of the earliest references of blindness that was seen in Hindi cinema. If you are analyzing any other, uh, you know, cinema in any other language, maybe you can do, you know, you can have a study of which was the first disabled character that was seen in that language cinema. Since I did my PhD, so I'm just giving you references from my PhD work. So this was that first reference from uh, the film called Jailer, 1938. This is, a. Uh, will just, uh, you know, de uh, describe the picture here. So you can see six beggars walking across the street. And these are all blind beggars. And the beggars have kept, the beggars have kept supporting each other by, you know, putting one, you know, helping each other out while crossing the road uh, by keeping a hand on the other beggar. Okay, so this was one of the first visuals that appeared in Hindi cinema during 1930s. We will also see how, how far we have come from this kind of narrative. And you can do that for any other cinema also. Uh, try to look at uh, the earliest depictions of disability and maybe look at the more contemporary re representations to understand if there is a change, if there is a shift in the representation of disability. So this is something that appeared as the first, almost, I'm not saying this is the first, I think this is the uh, second, uh, you know, uh, visual of uh, disability that appeared in Hindi cinema. There was a, there were two more films before that, but uh, they also had a similar kind of narrative where blindness was associated with uh, pity, sympathy, in need of help, in need of charity, and this whole idea of dependency around it. Now, I have taken a quote from uh, Georgina Cleage's memoir, Sight Unseen. She is a blind writer, where she, and she writes about how blindness is seen. Blind means darkness, dependence, destitution, despair. Blind means the beggar in the subway station. Look at him, slouching there, unkept, head bowed, stationary among the crowd, intermittently and involuntary twitch jerks in his arm upward, making the coin or two in his cup clink. Otherwise, he is silent. Apparently speechless. A sign around his neck reads, I am blind, please help. Because blind means need help and also needs charity. So she has very lucidly talked about how blind people are seen across the world. Let us look at a few opening scenes from a few films to understand a few entry points into looking at disability around you, to understand disability around you, and how it is so ingrained in us 
to look at disability in binaries. What are the two binaries that we can talk about when we talk about disability? Anyone? What are the two binaries that you can think of? Anyone? Is it ability and disability? Okay. What else? Some one Now, of you when we talk here... about binary of disability, uh, mm -hmm. it means that there is one person who is physically privileged and there is another person who is less privileged than the other person. I am talking about much more, you know... Uh, how do, how does a non disabled person looks at a disabled person some one of you mentioned here helen keller is a great inspiration okay now this is one of the aspects of the binary that i am talking about you you come across a lot of uh, you know media portrayals we see a lot of reality shows where a blind contestant or a physically disabled contestant would come perform something. And there's this whole idea of inspiration that is garnered from that character, from that person. Or there is um, a or there is a tragic story which is told to the audience to garner that kind of sympathy, pity around that person. So I'm talking about this binary of tragedy versus inspiration, which is the usual narrative around disability around us. There was this one film, Koshish, and I have used the picture here from the film Koshish here, where you see a person, this is from the opening scenes of the film, where a person is using sign language to communicate. And the credits of the film are told in, if, if you have watched the film, you would see that the first visual of the film is that of a person using sign language to communicate. Two people talking with each other using sign language. And the name of the film is Koshish, which means effort. This is one of the most progressive films that you would watch in Hindi cinema, but the film has its own problems, which we can discuss in detail if you wish to. But why I have used this scene here, I am just bringing a point here, to make you understand that one can move beyond this idea of tragedy versus inspiration and move beyond the binaries of ability and disability. This was attempted by the director in 1970. This, this is a film which is made in 1970 where the director has tried to look at disability beyond the binaries. How the director did that? You will have to watch the film for that. It is available on YouTube with the subtitles. Those of you who do not understand Hindi, those of you who are not well versed in Hindi, maybe you can watch the film in, uh, using the subtitles. But this is one of the key moments of the film where you introduce another language to communicate. A language that is used by the deaf community. It's a sign of assertion for the deaf community to respect the deaf community and not make some kind of inspiration or tragic story out of a deaf couple. It's a very humane story if one watches the film. The film has its own problems. Towards the end, it again falls into the loop of a tragic story. But two hours in the film and you would feel that it's a very, very humane look at a deaf couple.
Okay. The next scene here is from the film Khamoshi the Musical. This was made in 1996. This is the opening scene of the film where the, the daughter is raising an impossible dream. She is saying, Papa, can you hear me? Now the father here is a deaf person. Both the parents are deaf. So she is a coda, child of deaf adults, C-O-D-A. Now the story interestingly starts with this one line. And the next line that you, you would see in the film is, she writes, what is the life without an impossible dream? What is the impossible dream here? To make the parents listen to this daughter. However, the parents are deaf. And throughout the film, you would see Annie, who is the daughter, complaining about the parents being deaf. And her frustration of being child to deaf parents. She would talk about this impossible dream where the parents would call out her name. Which gets completed towards the end of the film. So when we are creating narratives like these around disability, what are we doing? Towards the end, you would see the deaf character with a lot of effort calling out to Annie. Basically, the deaf character is falling into the expectations of a society which is ableist. An ableist society would try to fix disability. An ableist society would try to make everyone around abled and would try to diminish disability, would try to diminish body diversity. So with one opening scene and one ending closing scene, you see how narratives could speak so much. A lot of people would just skip the scene. Might not, you know, pay attention to the scene. But if you look at it, it says a lot about the milieu in which the film was created. Films are never created in isolation. They are a reflection of in the world which we live. So it's a, it's a two-way process. Either films would be influencing the society, either society would be influencing the films. It's a mutual kind of relationship that we have, cinema and society. But how the films get constructed, how the narratives, how literature gets constructed, something that it raises out of a milieu. So when we create narratives like these, it is coming out of something. It is something coming out of some context. So we are trying to understand that context. How are we building an ableist society? How are we bringing, how are we making it more and more compulsory able-bodied? When we are fixing disabled characters in a film, when we talk about narratives of tragedy and inspiration around us, in association with disabled people. What are we trying to do? We are falling in that loop of compulsory able-bodiedness. We'll come to that. And this is the next scene that I was talking about. But what is the life without an impossible dream? The impossible dream here is to make a deaf person talk and listen in an ableist world. So the deaf person does a lot of effort 
and you can watch the film and see the kind of effort the 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 parents would put in to basically speak out Annie's name. So there's a lot of emotional labor that goes in a in a disabled person in an ableist society to fit in an ableist society. This is another visual from the film called Guzarish. This was made in 2010. How do visuals around us influence us? And this is the responsibility of a storyteller. When we create stories, when we create literature, when we create cinema, it's the responsibility of the creators to create images. What kind of images one, are, one is creating? What kind of stories one is telling? So here you have a story where you see, uh, I know most of you would be aware of this film. Uh, the male protagonist, Hrithik Roshan, is uh, lying on his bed. And uh, he is a quadriplegic in the film. He's playing a quadriplegic. And you can see that this is, uh, there, there are numerous frames that are, uh, you know, pasted on the roof. And he's lying on the bed and he sees himself in the, on the in a, in a mirror which is placed on the roof and around the present visual which is he lying on the bed you see various other frames of his past where he is a magician and not a quadriplegic so this is and the film has so many such visuals and towards the end the film would talk about euthanasia the film would talk about ending one's life, which is not worth living. Again, to coming to the point of how who decides this world? Who decides what life is worth living? And you would see the, the character talking about, uh, you know, assisted suicide. And the whole film would be talking about that whole idea of not being fit to be a part of this world, a world which is ableist. So who is responsible for creating such stories? A person who is sitting at the back of the camera, the person who is writing that kind of story? Who is that person? Is it an ableist person? Is it a disabled person? Whose perspective is it? So when we talk about disability studies, it's very important to give that pen to a disabled person so that the disabled person could write stories about his or her life. Disability studies has a motto, nothing about us without us. So if you are talking about a disabled person, if you are reading about a disabled person, if you are creating a story about a disabled person, it's very important to include a disabled person in creating that piece of work. However, whatever films we have so far watched, I'm not sure of uh, other language cinemas. I'm talking about Hindi cinemas. There are very few films that have actually included disabled people in the making of the film. And to what extent do you make a disabled person part of creating that film? There was a film called Ship of Theseus. Now this is the opening scene of Ship of Theseus. As the planks and it's a quote, as the planks of Theseus's ship needed repair, it was replaced part, part by part, up to a point where not a single part from the original ship remained in it anymore. 
is it then still the same ship if all the discarded parts were used to build another ship which of the two if either is the real ship of theseus and i would request you all to maybe watch this film if possible it's a it's a wonderfully made film it might come across as a boring film to most it it does come across as a boring film but the kind of narrative it creates it's a very in depth narrative of how it looks at bodies how do we look at a body are we are we going to remain same uh since the time we were born till the time we would die our bodies are constantly changing our bodies are in a continuum some time in life we would need an assistive device our blood cells they replace themselves each day so we are a new person we might look the same but the cells of the body are constantly dying replacing with new cells so what is this whole idea of living in the the nostalgia of the past body rosemary garland thompson talks about disability and representation she states disability is a story we tell about bodies it is yet it is a received it is a received yet pliable story that changes over time and across places representation structures rather than reflect reality the way we imagine disability through images and narratives determines the shape of the material world the distribution of resources our relationships with one another and our sense of ourselves so disability is not just you know that binary of ability and disability normal and abnormal fit and unfit it says much more how a disabled person operates in a world which is ableist says a lot about the structures the power relations around us how we have whether we have made accessible roads whether we have accessible universities whether we have accessible classrooms you know it's a, it's a every every disabled body would talk about the power structures around it and it's 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 relational how disability would change over time and across places a person might feel disabled in a university which is in india but might not feel disabled in a university which is maybe situated in the uk so the the disability also changes over time and across places let us come to this idea of stigma this is one of the earliest ideas of how the bodies are othered erving goffman somewhere around 1950s gave this idea of stigma and that is one of the most important concepts to talk about how bodies create a stranger of the other bodies how do we attribute stigma to a physically di different body goffman's work is one of the key works to understand this whole idea of stigma how we stigmatize a body against the other and we have read it in our ma and mphil but this work is one of the key works to it's it's one of the key works in the entry point as as an entry point in disability studies in the discipline of uh, disability studies 
So this is a very important work to look at if you are trying to understand disability studies. I will not go deeper into it because I do have a few more slides that I thought we'll talk about. Now I have placed three scenarios here. The first one is you are sitting in a metro compartment and a person with cerebral palsy using a wheelchair enters through the door and is drooling. Second scenario here, but at a traffic signal and a blind beggar knocks on your car. Third scenario, you see someone with one of his legs amputated and is using a crutch. What happens in a non-disabled mind? You create a meta-narrative of disability. This idea was given by David Bolt. In one of his key works, uh, the name of the text was Meta-Narrative of Blindness, where Bolt talks about how we build a cloud of stories around a disability. We get into causation, we get into why this happened, how this happened, and maybe create an awkward situation in that encounter with the disabled person. It's a lengthy work. You have it available on uh, online. If you want, I can also pass it on. But I just thought to maybe introduce you with this idea of meta narrative. The larger story that we build around disability, which is full of stereotypes, which is full of attitudes, social attitudes, cultural attitudes, historical attitudes towards disability. What it doesn't have is the micro narrative. What are these micro narratives? Micro narratives would be the lived experiences of disability which one needs to take into consideration to understand disability, to understand the life of a disabled person, to understand how disability has been seen through, has been seen across ages. The bell curve. This is another idea which was given by Leonard Davis the idea is, is he basically used this idea. The bell curve is the idea given by the uh, people, uh, statisticians, where they talk about creating a graph in the shape of a bell. The people who are accepted, people who are seen as the majority, the majority here is the able-bodied, would be seen inside the bell. Whereas people who are seen as deviants, people who are disabled, who do not fit into the majority, who are seen as undesirable, unfit, would be at the ends of the bell. So he used this idea to basically describe how the society is constructed, how it constructs a norm. So those who fit in the bell would be seen as normal. Those who do not fit in the bell, who, those who are not average, those who are not the median, those who are not the majority, would be seen at the end of the bell and would be seen as deviants. This is a very simpler understanding explanation of the bell curve. You can read more about it in Leonard Davis' work enforcing normalcy. It's a text which is available. If you want, I can pass it on. Now, this is what I thought I'll talk about various models of disability. Medical model of disability. What is the medical model? Medical model would talk about disability in terms of uh, institutionalization, in terms of medicine, in terms of fixing disability. A lot of films that you would see, a lot of uh, narratives, a lot of stories of disability around you, you would come across where people would talk about fixing a disability. A lot of films that you would come across where the blind protagonist 
gets the eyesight back towards the end of the film and that is the story of the film where you know for example in a film like anurag or a film like uh jheel ke us paar these are a few hindi films that i'm talking about where the male protagonist would become the savior and would restore the eyesight of the female protagonist and that is what the story is so basically you are again trying to maintain the status quo what is the status quo of that of able bodiedness so this whole idea of creating narratives that promote compulsory able bodiedness we would come across these narratives in our daily lives also it's not just films why i am referring to films is just to make you understand how things are constructed around us how we also believe in those ideas so medical model will look at disability as an individual's problem now i am using the word problem here and we use it very casually he has that problem she has that problem not addressing what disability are we talking about we use the word problem there and that is a medical model of disability where the onus of disability is on that one individual person the society would be not responsible for that disability and that individual has to deal with the disability on its own the society the society would make that person responsible for that disability so it is also known as the individual tragedy model another model is the religio charity model of disability where you see disability through religion and through charity and you would see that you know people would do all sort of efforts to cure disability to fix disability by going to new numerous temples believing in a lot of superstitions and not understanding that it's a biological thing the impairment is a biological thing so one would resort to numerous uh, you know either going to that uh, religious pilgrimage or you know the, so many more things to basically cure disability there's this another idea that is that comes through this model that of the karmic theory where you talk about disability uh, as sins of the past karma and it is seen as some sort of punishment that one has you know uh, got because of the past karmas because of the past sins that also you know uh, falls on the under the purview of religio charity model of disability again the responsibility of disability lying on that individual again you know there is this whole idea of tragedy which is related to disability social model of disability this is uh, somewhere you know you would see that there's a shift in how we look at disability this was given by mike oliver also uh, i shortened his name it's basically michael oliver and he proposed that it is due to the infrastructure so the the incapacity of the in infrastructure around us that a person would feel disabled so this was actually it, it was one of the most important shifts in disability studies where one saw that disability lies outside and not in that person so there is a shift from the medical religio charity model to a social model that talks about disability emanating from the society i have also used a chart here the social model of disability where it talks about various societal barriers it could be environmental institutional attitude you can have a look at it environmental would be inaccessible infrastructure 
lack of services, poor communication. Attitudinal would be negative stereotyping, poor understanding, increased social isolation. Institutional would be lack of employment opportunities, non-inclusive legislation, policies and procedures, lack of educational opportunity. Now, this model also does not, it's not the, you know, the, it, it's not a holistic model, basically. It does not include the lived experiences of disability, the emotional experiences of disability. So there's another model of disability called as the cultural model of disability, which sees disability as body diversity, which was proposed by David Michel and Snyder. You can read more about it. And it's a much more humane model of disability, which brings in the person first language here and talks about personhood, lived experiences, the daily life of a disabled person where it looks at various other aspects, not just the societal aspects, various other, various other aspects of uh, that creates a disability. There's another idea, another theoretical framework, which is known as the critical disability studies, which would question the epistemes. What are the epistemes? Epistemes are the, the fundamentals of who we are, fundamentals of the power structures. It would talk about intersectionalities, which the other models were not able to do. Intersectionality of race, gender, religion. So the other models that we saw before were more Western. Whereas critical disability studies uh, as a framework would look at, you know, uh, realities, disabled realities from out Asia, from the global south, which were not part of the other models. It would look at lived realities from the global south. It does, does not just focus on global north, it would also look at global south. If you want, I can also pass on material on critical disability studies. Compulsory able-bodiedness, I have discussed in one uh, in a lot of slides before. I'll not go deeper into it again. Narrative processes. This is a key idea to look at any of a literary text, any of a cinema, any of cinematic, any cinematic text, where you would see how disability has been used as a trope to basically take the story forward. When I was talking about how a female blind protagonist getting cured towards the end, the story was not around her. The story was basically to highlight the male protagonist's heroism. Now the blindness was used as a trope to highlight the heroism of that male protagonist. To further the story, a disability is used in a narrative. There are times when disability would be used as a metaphor in a story and not as the material reality, which has been done, you know, uh, for so many decades, where disability symbolizes something. Either it is evil, either it is punishment. You would see uh, the negative villainous characters of in a film, you know, becoming disabled towards the end. So disability being used as a punishment towards the end. Therefore, again, coming back to this whole idea that being disabled is worse than dying. So, you know, how these things are totally around us and we have internalized all these ideas and therefore, you know, people like us are creating these scripts. Why I'm referring to films is to make you understand that it is, it is, it has engulfed us a lot. The media images, the images that are propagated through various shows that we watch, the various films that we watch, 
the various narratives that we would read. So we need to be very cautious of what we are consuming, what we are producing. Normality genre, another idea which was given by Paul Dark. What are we doing through these narratives? Are we again bringing back this whole idea of normality? We think that we are talking about disability, but are we actually talking about disability or we are again, you know, creating a, a, a film which is promoting normality? This whole idea of what is normal and what is abnormal. So by the end of the film, you would see everyone as able-bodied. By the end of the film, you would see the disabled character as overcoming disability and coming at par with the non-disabled people. There are very popular films which are, you know, inspirational films to say, but what are they promoting? They are basically falling into, into the category of normality genre. There's this idea of inspiration porn, which was proposed by uh, one of the Australian uh, vloggers. She, her name is Stella Young. So referring to such, you know, films where, you know, the disabled character is overcoming a disability and the audience getting an idea that, you know, every disabled person is inspirational in that way. And we should, you know, feeling sorry for that person, feeling pitiful. And, you know, if that person is overcoming a disability, a non-disabled person is gaining inspiration out of. So this is falling into the category of a normality genre. And we are moving not beyond binaries then. We are again sticking to the binary of inspiration versus tragedy. How do we move beyond that? Let us see. In very short, I'm just going to end my lecture with a few uh, slides here. Now, this is a, again a quote which I took from Denny Morris, uh, her text Pride Against Prejudice. She says, disability in film has become a metaphor for the message that the non-disabled writer wishes to get across in the same way that beauty is used. In doing this, movie makers draw on the prejudice ignorance and fear that generally exist towards disabled, disabled people. Knowing that to portray a character with a humped back, with a missing leg, with facial scars, with, will evoke certain feelings with the audience. Unfortunately, the more disability is used as a metaphor for evil or just to induce a sense of unease, the more the cultural stereotype is confirmed. So by doing, by creating disability metaphors, we are again bringing back that idea of cultural stereotypes which are against disability. How do we go beyond these binaries? How do we look at disability as body diverse? A few films were able to do that. And how did they do that? First of the film that I spoke about was Koshish. So this uh, visual is from the film Koshish where you see a person signing uh, in the uh, sign language and uh, Koshish is written in yellow in Hindi and Urdu below that. The next visual is from the film Naje Mayuri where you see Mayuri sitting in pink her grandmother is sitting beside her and her friend is basically painting her prosthetic leg with the red alta and she is going to perform on stage uh, the classical dance form of Bharatnatyam. The film totally challenges this whole idea of how do we look at a classical dance form. Do classical dance forms allow a, a disabled person to perform on stage? If you look at Natya Shastra, it very specifically states that the person who is the nartak or the nartaki could not be disabled. So, you know, our, our literature would also 
talk about how these classical dance forms, how the classical uh, uh, art forms, you know, a person who is disabled could not be a could not become a part of these art forms. So Mayuri here challenges this whole idea of what is a classical dance form by just being present on the stage. The film again falls into the idea, the binary of tragedy versus inspiration, but it was able to create that kind of space where one was able to create a dialogue on what is a classical dance, what is a classical art form, and how do we look at bodies? Our bodies are ever evolving, our bodies are in continuum. One might need to use a wheelchair sometime in one's life. So how do we create structures? Are we living in a world full of egoism of ability? Or do we move beyond that? The next scene is from the film Koshish, where there are three characters sitting. The two on the right, uh, the middle one is, uh, the, the two on the right are deaf. And on the left, you see a person who is blind. And they are discussing how both of these, how both, how they all have very different ways of feeling a sunset. So the person on the left who is blind talks about how he witnesses a sunset. They are sitting on a beach and they are discussing how sunset is different for each one of them. It's a beautiful scene and if you watch the film maybe you would see what I'm trying to and you would understand what I'm trying to say and how blind would understand sunset in his or her own way and a deaf would understand sunset in his or her own way. So we are trying to look at how there are different ways of being, how there are different ways of operating in a world which is ableist. This is another film, another visual from the film Sparsh where you see a blind person as the principal of a blind school. This was actually the first time in Hindi cinema where you basically saw a person not getting cured towards the end. So he is a blind person. He lives like a blind man and uh, he gets married also. You would see a relationship with a person who is non-disabled. So there is also an interabled relationship that one would see in this film. And the person is not fixed towards the end. It's a beautiful film made uh, by Sai Paranjpe. If you get some time, do watch this film. It's available on YouTube. Another film, another visual here is from the film Margarita with a Straw, where you see the mother uh, bathing the daughter who lives with cerebral palsy. So the, why I added this scene? Because it's so important to talk about friendships for disabled persons. For a disabled person. So I use this word of sororal spaces. Uh, I, I was talking about women with disabilities when I talked about this scene in my PhD and I talk about how sororal relationships are so important for women with disabilities. Not just for women with disabilities, it could be any, any person who is, uh, who is a disabled person and how friendships are so important. And most of the films you would see disabled characters, you know, left, uh, you know, they are not given any space to create friendships. They are not given space to any any sort of agency. So there is a person who falls in love with another person and that person decides, no, you have to get fixed. And then, you know, the person gets operated and that person is fixed. But there is no space of real friendships. So how do we create that space? When I was talking about lived experiences, this also comes under that. What is the basic routine of a disabled person? So you see something, a glimpse of that in this film where the mother is bathing this daughter who is living with cerebral palsy. Also, uh, you know, adding another layer to disability where we talk about caregivers. 
how family becomes the primary caregiver and it is not just the onus of the family to to uh, basically look after the disabled people it's basically something that the society the governments need to understand that they they we are all responsible for each other it's a system it's a mutual kind of it's a uh, how do we say that we all are dependent on each other it's not just you know disability which is seen as dependency but we also need to understand that we are all dependent on each other so we need to create systems where we support persons with disabilities this is another visual where you see an assistive device uh, so there's a blind photographer who is clicking photographs and then printing them through 3d printers this you can watch in the film chip of theseus and this is the visual that i end my presentation my lecture with you remember the first visual that i displayed here where you saw blind beggars helping out each other but this is a film uh, uh from the visual from the film chip of theseus created in 2010 i just thought it is very similar to that but how far we have we come now these are blind four blind people here in the in the picture that you can uh, that is there on the screen and they are basically at a phot photo uh, photography gallery at an exhibition and these are all 3d pictures so they can touch and uh, you know feel the or feel all the pictures which are basically taken by a blind photographer so how do we my question again how do we create sensitive portrayals how do we become more and more sensitive how do we become more inclusive It's the responsibility that each one of us has to take, right? We need to understand how bodies are basically assemblages, acknowledge, accept different ways of being and not impose our ways of being on the other person. So we need to reframe disability beyond the narratives of binaries thank you i'm uh, ending uh, this slide share and sorry if i have taken too much time no ma'am it was absolutely amazing um so after ma'am's enriching talk i would like to add that disability studies uh, poster empowerment uh, emphasizing the strengths and also resilience of individuals with disabilities. It celebrates diversity, challenging social norms to create inclusive environments. Through advocacy and research, disability studies uh, also strive to enhance accessibility. And also it promotes equal opportunities uh, and amplify the voices of those of diverse abilities fostering a positive and inclusive society. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this enriching session Thank with you us. So much. And we would like to know more about it uh, in upcoming days. Definitely, definitely. Uh, now, uh, I would like to ask uh, participant uh, that uh, if you have any query regarding this, you can directly ask to ma'am or you can just uh, share it with the chat box. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I have a question. Uh, autism and disabled. What is the difference between autism and uh, disabled? There's, I would not say that uh, it's a, I think that you need to reframe the question for this. Uh, autism is seen as a cognitive disability. So uh, it is a sort of a disability, falls under the purview of cognitive disability learning cognitive disabilities and it's a it's a huge spectrum so uh, you know it would be uh, one could be uh, a little less autistic the other could be a little more on the spectrum so it's a it's a huge spectrum that you know 
and uh, there are tests to understand that who is on uh, what, who is at what level of autism. So it falls under the category of cognitive disability, learning cognitive disability. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, good evening. Ma'am, yes. uh, what's the best word we can use to address disabled people so that we can be, as you said, more sensitive towards them? Persons with disabilities, person first language. But I think it would be also convenient to ask a person with disability how that person would like to get addressed. I think that is the most sensitive way to understand that person. And maybe if you have to address the general population, then we use the word persons with disabilities. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, in the chat box. Okay, Priyanka, please go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Uh, yeah. How, as individuals, we can be more helpful and, uh, uh, you know, inclusive of disabled people? Right. I think uh, when I started, you know, my PhD journey, this was also one of the, one of the, I think, most important question that I came across while I was researching. And I always felt that, you know, I don't get a clear answer for this. So I would not give you an answer for this. Okay. I think once you start reading disability studies, you would yes. automatically automatically get the answer for this. Yes, I get it. So I would not suggest that you know, this is how it is. This is how you become more inclusive. Mm -hmm. I think you need to read. And first of all, as where I started my lecture, to unlearn. Okay. Unlearn a lot of ideas that we have internalized all our life. I think that is the first step towards inclusivity. I can give you the first step. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yes, yes. Um, excuse me, ma'am. Hmm. Yes, Priyanka. Um, basically, uh, we all are like you said that um, I believe that soci uh, like uh, disability is a social construct and we as a ab able-bodied people we impose our able bodiedness uh, in uh, like in every aspects of society so through this session i got to know about uh, this compulsory uh, able bodiedness and um, there are challenges so uh, basically we need to overcome it and there is a long way uh, uh, and there is a long like path yes it's it's a long path and I would say, uh, you know, we also need to understand that along with social construct, it also it is also a reality. It's a material reality for a lot of people who are, you, you know, wheelchair users, who are using any sort of assistive device. So uh, who are living with disabilities, invisible, visible. I didn't have time to go deeper into the various kinds of disabilities. You know, if we have any further lecture, I can also devote, uh, you know, time to various other kinds of disabilities. But there are a lot of invisible disabilities. You know, we are maybe, we even don't know somebody sitting next to us is living with some sort of disability. There are so many bodily conditions which fall under the purview of disability. And it's getting added. So the list is increasing, you know. What would you uh, like? This, there are so many uh, illnesses which are getting added to the list these days. Uh, which you are, you know, which are invisible. That you and I, maybe you know, if the, somebody is not using any visual uh, assistive devices for for that kind of illness, but it but it adds to a lot of disabilities. So uh, one of the key ideas that I gave in the start of you know, there is one idea which is what would you call an impairment. The other is disability. So that impairment is leading to some sort of disability. Right? So also try to understand how these things are different from each other. So yes, the list is long and the, the journey is long. This is just a very introductory 
lecture for you all uh, sharing what i have done in the past 9 years in very very short in very very short uh good evening ma'am uh, i have a question what mm -hmm. methodology one should follow while researching on uh, disability especially invisible disabilities you will have to read about it again i cannot give any clear uh, you know i would not impose any answers here try to look at critical disability studies because that is much more uh, open and it it has a space for intersectional approaches and it's a much more humane kind of uh, theoretical framework cultural model of disability and uh, critical disability studies these are the very newer kind of uh, theoretical frameworks which are used thank you ma'am uh, mm -hmm. i also have another question yes. i was planning on uh, making my proposal phd proposal on this topic so can digital discourse like social media memes can they be considered as a viable source of information and study in this field try to look out for the primary texts first if there is enough primary text available i think uh, that is the literature review that you will have to do uh, like for for in my case i had a lot of films to refer to so there was a corpus of uh, you know work that was bare but i had to basically understand to basically curate the indian disability discourse there which i have not touched yet in the lecture the indian disability studies this was just a very uh, you know introductory lecture on the western uh, ideas that have been given by western scholars but my uh, you know effort while i was uh, researching was to you know try to find if i can create an indigenous way of um, looking at women with disabilities in india because again that whole idea of intersectionality kyunki it it's it gets layered more and more the marginalization gets layered more and more Mom, if you talk about global south it's called double marginalization when you are a not woman. just double so many layers get added priyanka if you talk about women with disabilities in india look at the kind of layers that you would add you know while uh, looking at that one character class caste so many more ideas that you can you know talk about and how all of it could impact that woman's disability or the man's disability so you know it it's a you know interesting discourse if you try to see how femininity and disability if they are you know seen together and if masculinity and disability are seen together what happens in that kind of intersectionality it's so interesting you know um, masculinity and uh, disability because femininity and disability is you know seen more like a redundant redundancy that you know a woman is already you know uh, marginalized so you know there is one more layer which is added of marginalization but when it comes to a, a man so a man being disabled is seen as a contradiction then you know how has somebody who was supposed to be the savior who was supposed to you know take care of the family unit that person got a disability so this is another discourse that gets added there so there are so many you know uh, areas that one can look at masculinity and disability is also another uh, you know idea that one can look into uh, not much of work has been done in india on that a lot of women writers have started writing on women and disability but not much of uh, has uh, uh, not much work has been done in the area of masculinity and disability in india thank you ma'am Uh, ma'am there is a question from angeline angeline do you want to speak ha huh. uh so uh, i hope uh, i can just ha you can read that it message out. yeah uh so she wants to know a little bit about body calligraphy yes. uh, so, uh, which you have given in the last yes. slide yeah. so body calligraphy uh, 
it's i was referring to one of the films for that where you know you talk about different ways of uh, of being so just to give you an example how would a deaf say uh, there's a deaf couple living in a in a house so they would have a different way of uh, operating like like somebody who is non deaf would be using a doorbell but if there is some there's a there's a deaf couple living in a house they would use more of lights it would not they would not have doorbells they would have lights to indicate that there is somebody on the door somebody at the door and somebody who is blind would have assistive devices which would help that person to understand maybe a, the temperature of of tea you know you would have the uh, those white canes to walk and the white canes that you get in the market today for blind people they also have those gps uh, you know inbuilt in them so there's a different way of operating in a world which is ableist so body calligraphy they are meant that every body is different and we need to understand that there is a different way of being there so therefore i use the word body calligraphy yeah ma'am thank you ma'am mm -hmm. one last question it is from our youtube watcher yeah. um, so uh, he is asking that how do you see renaming of the word biklang to divya how it affected in reception of disability in india it is from rishab uh rishab that is a a very important question that you asked and i think uh, this whole idea that of tokenism that we see around us where you know uh whether it's the inspirational idea that we attach to a disabled person it is very similar to that where we have attached divine attribute to a disabled person so it's very contradictory also the government has basically just you know added something to the to the nomenclature but how well the government is you know helping Uh, or you know creating accessibility for a disabled person that is still under question and once you attach divine attributes to a person you basically also say that you know that person has some sort of divine ability which is very contradictory to the real reality of a disabled person so basically you are doing away with all the responsibilities so what would you do with naming somebody as divyang something that we all need to look at that person who who lives with disability would not feel god like any time in life you know that person is not some sort of a of a super person there you know we can't attach these hyper realities to a person with disability they they live with daily material realities of you know uh, oppression marginalization the real issues of you know the daily uh, day to day things that a person with disability would face so one needs to also try to understand how the nomenclature is not just you know just to name a person like that there is much more that goes into it so i think one needs to question all these ideas uh which university in india where research is going on uh, disability studies currently which department on disability so uh in literature uh in du jnu um there has been portions which have been added on disability studies uh law universities offer uh you know courses on disability and legislation policies and all so maybe one can look into that uh the depart the universities are working in creating departments on disability studies but uh, i'm not sure if there is a purely uh, you know uh, department for disability studies as of now in any of the universities it's a very newer kind of discipline
this might have right. yes so these are the social yes. sciences institutes uh, which uh, would uh, offering courses on disability stuff yes I come more from yeah. the language and humanities background. So uh, DU has added two courses on disability studies. It has added texts on disability studies to basically look at literary uh, representations of disabled people. Yes, Kajal. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Nidhi, we can't take your questions now because we are already running out, out yeah. of time. Uh, so please uh, save your question. We will forward it to ma'am. Yes, and uh, if you want, I can post my email ID here. If there are yeah. any more questions, maybe I can, we can talk over email. Yes, I'm doing that. And in case anyone sure. needs any of the texts, do write to me. I have a huge, uh, you know, uh, bibliography with me that I can share. I would love to share and let us all read. Yes, definitely. We will have another session. Do I'll, sure, I'll speak sure. with Kalyani, ma'am. Let's see. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We will have it. Yes. for the Sure. Uh, okay, for saying that, um, I would like to just request Ritika. Are you there? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, good evening. Yeah. So, so Mansi, ma'am, uh, Ritika is there for such some formal vote of thanks. Please accept it. Ritika, Definitely. please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to our honorable guest speaker, Dr. Mansi Gova for her in, uh, illuminating lecture on disability studies. Her expertise has broadened our perspectives and paved the way for students interested in further research on this critical topic. Dr. Grover's insights and emphasis on inclusivity provides a solid foundation inspiring us to delve deeper into understanding and addressing the challenges faced by individuals with disabilities. Thank you for your uh, invaluable contribution, ma'am. Thank you for enriching our understanding and empowering us to contribute meaningfully to disability studies. Uh, next, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Kalani Walat, the driving force behind our journey. Her dedication and outstanding teaching have made today possible and inspired a passion for learning. Kalani ma'am's mentorship has been instrumental in turning challenges into opportunities. A warm thanks, uh, thank you to CSRF for uh, orchestrating the insightful lecture. The meticulous organization ensured a seamless and enriching experience. Lastly, a sincere expression of gratitude to all the participants for their invaluable contribution to the success of our event. Your engagement and collaborative spirit enriched our discussions, making it a more memorable and insightful experience. Each of you has played uh, each of you played a vital role and we anticipate future engagements. Once again, thank you everyone for your dedication and valuable contribution to our, our shared learning journey. Uh, now before concluding, I would like to draw attention to another free resource by Wallet, the Wallet newsletter designed to help explore new research areas. You're welcome to be a part of it. Thank you uh, so much. See you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ritika. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, 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 so everyone, uh, if you want to know more about such uh, cultural studies research forum and their research areas and all, you can join our Telegram group. Uh, just uh, search Cultural Studies Research Forum. Also, please do visit our website, valat.in there you will get all the endeavors started by our valat education thank you so with saying that ma'am with your permission i am ending this session thank you so much thank you so much thank you